يا ميدي Good morning, everybody. Welcome for another seminar from the Institute of Astrophysica de Andalusia in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk Astronomy with Neutrino Telescopes by Dr. Agustin Sánchez Loza from the Instituto de Física Corp Corpuscular CESIC in Valencia, Spain. Uh, Agustin will be properly introduced by Dr. Rubén uh, López Cort. Please, Rubén. Well, hi everybody. So, so welcome, uh, welcome here today, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Agustin. So Agustin uh, did his uh, uh, studies in the University of Valencia. He did uh, over there also his masters, uh, working on the Antares telescopes, uh, and also his PhD. Actually, did in PhD, right? Mm -hmm. uh, studying uh, transient gamma ray sources like active galactic nuclei, X-ray binaries. And so on and so forth. Then he spent uh, six years or so in uh, in INFN uh, in Bari in the Instituto di Fisica you know, Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare in uh, in Italy. <laughs> and then uh, afterwards uh, he came back and he's uh, now working at DFIC again as one of these in this in this investigador distinguido de gente. <laughs> Uh, of the general data Valenciana at, uh, at IFIC again, where he works uh, on the calibrations, analysis of multi multi messenger astronomy with a large volume water channel cup detector. So, I was thinking today we'll be talking uh, to us about, uh, in general, about uh, astronomy with uh, neutrino telescopes. I guess uh, it will not have any bias uh, belonging <laughs> to the Antares and K collaborations. <laughs> But uh, he will talk to us uh, in general. Okay, so please, uh, I'll think. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks to the Institute of Analogia for this opportunity. Uh, I can mention also that uh, I work in the, within IFIC in the group of Valencia Experimental Group of Astroparticles, that is the Vega, we don't NH, not like a high energy group of for astrophysicists from the Institute of uh, Astrophysical Analogia. I will uh, do a compendium of how the neutrino telescopes work and uh, uh, explain how the analysis can be performed in order to the astronomy with them. And then I will present uh, uh, the, late, the latest results, the most relevant results in the in this sense. So I divide it more or less in three steps, in three blocks this, this talk. So what is a neutrino telescope? The first idea uh, of uh, this kind of detector was proposed by Markov in the international uh, uh, conference of high energy physics in 1960. Uh, we're proposing uh, uh, to use natural transparent uh, media uh, uh, to monitor, uh, to detect the cherry pop uh, emission of particles within that volume to, in order to, um, to detect uh, uh, atmospheric moles, but also uh, uh, neutrino interactions of high energy. Uh, to reach the sensitivity for the cosmic neutrino flux, uh, um, a volume of this detector uh, should be of around a cubic kilometer. <clears throat> and many te uh, neutrino telescopes have been uh, designed around the time. There has been many pathfinders. I will summarize a bit then. But the basic idea is you have a large transparent medium like ice or water, and you you place there a, a three dimensional matrix, an array of arrangement of low photomultipliers to survey the light in this uh, volume, having uh, a kind of a tracking calorimeter. So with this idea in mind, <clears throat> uh, regarding the size of, the, of this detector and the density of these uh, light detectors within the, uh, the detector, you will be sensitive to some energies or others of neutrino, of, uh, of neutrino fluxes. Uh, in the case of neutrino telescope, this aim mostly to go from the GV neutrinos to the PV, even EV, which correspond mostly to uh, the, the, the atmospheric neutrinos and the cosmic neutrinos and the cosmogenic ones. Uh, so the atmospheric are those created by cosmic rays in the in the uh, uh, in the atmosphere of the air. Cosmic are those expected from uh, cosmic ray accelerators uh, and astrophysical sources. And cosmogenic is hypothesized, hypothesized to be the <clears throat> 
the flux that could be resulting from the cosmic ray interaction with the CMB. Uh, regarding the energy range, you can perform different kinds of physics uh, with neutrino telescopes at the lowest energies, MEB. You, I will explain how you can do that, but you cannot resolve MEB events within these detectors, but you can still try to detect them, uh, detect them so you can be sensitive to core collapse supernova detection. Since the, for those events, you expect like a, 20 MeV neutrinos coming from. Also, at GB energies, you can perform studies on the neutrino properties, like uh, neutrino oscillations. And yeah, at higher energies, you can perform either studies of dark matter searches or, or exotic uh, searches like uh, neutralins and uh, other particles, or astronomy. So I'm going to, to focus on this talk. Uh, so the link uh, basically is that when you uh, will have a cosmic ray acceleration in a detector, if it targets a medium, it will have hadronic interactions and the resulting decays will provide a flux of neutrinos that will reach Earth uh, and absorb them. Uh, therefore, uh, these are going to be uh, used in correlation with gamma rays, but gamma reproduction can be uh, due to mm, mm, many other uh, reasons. So seeing gamma rays is not a clear hint that you have uh, a direct hint that you have a cosmic ray acceleration, uh, but neutrinos is a clear, uh, uh, a clear, a clear uh, proof of uh, adronic, an adronic scenario so where you can have a cosmic ray acceleration. So it, it has its interest on, on this side. Uh, on gravitational waves, also there are some, some models, so you, you can look for them, so the, the, um, the fluxes are not supposed to be uh, so high yet, but uh, there are uh, some limits that can be placed. So basically, we are just, uh, with neutrino telescopes uh, for astronomy, looking at from agents to microquasars, the galactic center, or even coming from uh, supernova remnants, corpora supernova, and transients, like uh, um, and much of the compact objects, gamma rebars, etc. So, which neutrino telescopes uh, are in the world? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, we there have been like uh, pathfinders that were uh, attempt uh, attempt uh, first attempts to to build up neutrino telescopes. The first one was Duman in Hawaii in the seventies. Was not fruitful, but. Uh, Baikal was uh, managed to be one of the first built. Uh, it was in the building the Lake Baikal in the 90s. Same for Amanda in the Antarctic ice. Some uh, Iranian projects uh, were attempted, and Antares was uh, completed. And I, I work there, so I, I'm going to focus on the results of Antares. Currently, they are taking data uh, Ice Cube that has been completed a decade ago, more than a decade ago, KentNet, and uh, Great uh, Volume Detector in the Lake Baikal confident in the Mediterranean, both in uh, taking data in partial configurations as they are uh, growing now. So the pathfinders, so like Antares uh, or Amanda or Baikal, were like a 1% of the ice cube, that is the cubic kilometer uh, detector and probably the most known uh, neutrino telescope. And the ones that are currently taking data or, or even being built are going to reach that volume, the uh, cubic kilometer. Uh, they have been planned for the following decade uh, start to build up uh, another detectors like Gentry uh, uh, and Ice Cube uh, in the Pacific Ocean, P1, uh, in the South Sea of China, uh, has been announced uh, Trident uh, a few years ago, I think. And uh, the last summer, uh, Hunt and another project called Neon, uh, both in China, were like presented in the International Cosmic Ray Conference, uh, saying that they plan to do also another neutrino telescope detector uh, hand either on the Baikal or on the south of, of China. ISCUBE also is planning to do an upgrade uh, mm -hmm. too, that uh, during the next decade or during this decade that will uh, make it larger and more sensitive to even higher flux energy. So starting with ISCUBE, that is the most known uh, neutrino telescope, is the largest ever built. Uh, and currently still is the largest one. Um, it's buried uh, two kilometers and a half in the in the South Pole in the uh, in the Antarctic uh, ice sheet, and uh, uh, it's comprised it's comprised of uh, eighty six lines of uh, one kilometer eight and in an hexagonal array as you can see here uh, of one kilometer base more or less. 
Uh, ice at those depths are really transparent, but there is a dust layer at uh, around 100 meters width, uh, half detector more or less from some volcanic eruptions in the past that uh, divide a bit in half the detector. Um, it also comes with a more dense configuration for be sensitive to lower energies, that is called deep core. And as I mentioned, it's uh, planned to, to be extended to, to, uh, to reach uh, higher energies. It also comes with an uh, ice top array where he can try to use it to get out ongoing cosmic ray showers uh, and therefore the events that uh, reach the detector. In the Mediterranean Sea, we have uh, uh, basically two, uh, two infrastructures. One in the south of France, where it was Antares, and close by there is now uh, one of the of the detectors of Cantinet, and the other the south of Sicily, where there is the other one. Uh, Antares, uh, it was a pathfinder, a one person volume of uh, ice cube, more or less, that uh, it was intended to work only so a few years, I think until 2014 or 15, I don't remember very well, but it has been working well beyond its expected due time with a minimum maintenance until 2022. So it has been taking data for, for uh, 15 years. Um, and this detector was comprised of 12 vertical lines of around uh, 500 meters and spaced around 70 meters uh, between them. Um, this is a, an artistic view of Antares because we cannot do a photo of this kind of detector. So it's an, a way to try to imagine how, how it looks. It was composed by 25 stories per line with three neighbor optical models. And we have Kentrinet now which is uh, a two-site infrastructure uh, with two configurations. In the south of uh, France, close to, to where it was Antares, now there is a, a, a Kentrinet Orca configuration, which has a much, a much more dense uh, uh, array. And uh, it aims to, to be sensitive to lower energies. Uh, so uh, it's mostly suited for uh, studies of atmospheric neutrinos. And then at the south of Sicily, there is going to be the 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 currently with twenty eight string the large configuration for for mostly astronomy uh, purposes, and uh, that will consist in two building blocks of uh, half kilometer eight and uh, around one uh, one kilometer of base made of each of those of uh, one hundred fifty uh, lines. These uh, vertical lines, uh, instead of half like individual photomultipliers, they have a composed uh, Photomultiplier uh, technology, which gives a lot more of uh, directional sensitivity, and uh, this is more or less how. <laughs> Sorry, it's because the video. Uh... So my apologies, but uh, it's because the video automatically was reproduced with sound, and uh, I couldn't. Uh, can you hear me in the Zoom room? Yes, no problem. Okay, because I touched a bit the, the volume. Thank you. So basically, you uh, roll the, the complete uh, line within one of these uh, circular structures. You uh, place them in the bottom of the sea where you are planning to, to place the vertical line, uh, let them to touch the bottom. With remote operative vehicles, you connect to the Yanshion box that connects with a cable to shore where you can control uh, if all the instruments uh, have survived, are okay, everything is green light. So you can then uh, release it and uh, do the unfurling of the view, uh, leaving in place the, the vertical view as uh, we can see in the video on the on the right. So, well, this is an artistical view of uh, impression of uh, Kentrinet, uh, the forest of. Uh, uh, model optical models with photomultipliers. How can we use uh, these two to these uh, devices? So, <clears throat> um, we are going to detect all the light within this uh, volume of uh, this medium. Uh, this light, uh, we aim for detect the light coming from uh, particles, charged particles, and we are going to be uh, regarding of the particle across the detector, sensitive to one or another in function of the energy of the particle. Uh, they have going to have a different mean path. So as you can see here, the muons propagate much, much longer than showers. So you expect to see much more muons in equal of amount of interactions than showers that, uh, crossing your detector. So 
the statistics of your detector will be dominated by, by muon tracks that cross your, your detector. And those are helping at very high energies and the statistic is very low. So you're going to be mostly dominated by, by muon tracks. Since you are the main source of data you will have, you are going to have are, uh, muon tracks. Uh, you are going to see also muons coming down from, from cosmic rays in the atmosphere. So uh, you have a, a very, um, very um, several orders of magnitude larger than neutrino fluxes, uh, don't go in more fluxes from the cosmic rays, uh, but they are going to be don't go in. So you will have a, a background of muons, atmospheric muons, that usually you are not interested if you are looking for neutrinos, that came from above. This means that you use these telescopes mostly looking upwards, since neutrinos will cross the Earth. Uh, if the detector is in the South Pole, you will have in this upward sky one region of the sky uh, accessible. While, for example, for example, the galactic center is not accessible as I'm um, going in the in the from the South Pole. While in the Mediterranean Sea, for example, you can uh, look uh, in the upgoing uh, sky, uh, the center of the galactic bridge and the center of the galaxy. When you go to higher energies of neutrinos, the Earth starts to become a bit opaque, and then you uh, stop looking just only at upgoing events, and you focus mostly your sky is mostly the horizontal um, uh, sky. Uh, the kind of backgrounds you have, as I mentioned, one is atmospheric moons that uh, are crossing, coming from above to your detector. <coughs> the, those are going to depend mostly on the depth of that your detector there is. So Beta, for example, is very close to the surface. They have an important amount of ongoing atmospheric moons. Uh, Ice Cube, Antares, and, and Orca are at two kilometers depth, and Arca that is at three kilometers depth have less uh, ongoing moons. Uh, this is an important uh, background because, uh, well, you don't recognize what is crossing your detector, but you just see light. And with the light, you try to uh, attain a reconstruction. And if by error you misreconstruct a ongoing track as upgoing, even if you cut only the, the all the uh, ongoing events, you keep only the upgoing, you will, you, sometimes you will have one of those in the upgoing. So it's important that you take into account uh, more quality in your analysis so you can remove uh, as much as possible uh, this kind of background. Also, you have an irreducible background that is atmospheric ne neutrinos but that came from everywhere, from the uh, cosmic interactions in the atmosphere. But you can cancel, uh, well, you can cancel, you, you can, they, they will have a softer spectra than the signal that you are expecting to, to look after. So you are going to do a statistical analysis on that. Also in water, you have two uh, light backgrounds that uh, doesn't mimic with this. One is the K40 so isotope that we have uh, in uh, salt water. Uh, it's the decay. We'll create enough Cherenkovs to illuminate neighbor PMTs in, one of the, in, in these optical modules, which is, it can be indeed used to do a, a relative calibration of, of these uh, elements there. Also, you can have bioluminescent uh, events, which have a completely different um, uh, evolution and uh, they, they last they consist of the microseconds of a of a uh, event crossing the, the full detect. Uh, regarding the how we, we can detect these events, we basically get photons hits in, in, in our PMTs mm -hmm. and we try to feed them. Uh, regarding of the of the optical properties of the medium, the light, the Cherenkov light from the particles will arrive directly, more directly to the PMDs or more scattered, or they are going to arrive less or more regarding the, uh, the absorption of, of the medium. So, for example, water is not as transparent as the ice uh, in the deepest uh, depths in the Antarctica. Uh, but, uh, well, still they have one, one layer, as I mentioned before, uh, at a certain point where they are they have a very, uh, a very strong assortion of, of light. Uh, while the scattering is in the opposite, in the water, the, the light is barely not scattered. In the ice, it's much more complicated. Uh, there are many anisotropies and symmetries. Uh, it's the dependent and it's very complex. So indeed in Ice Cube, they have some, they work in something called the ice model that uh, is necessary to study better and to reconstruct better the, the events uh, there. So basically, water is optimal for pointing accuracy, and ice is better for calorimetry. In this uh, uh, sample, we can see uh, propagation of uh, a track 
light, uh, Cherenkov light. <clears throat> Uh, red is like a early detection of the photons, so they are not uh, scattered or anything. So red is good, and blue is like bad because the photons would arrive scattered from much later, and then your directional uh, is much worse. Uh, of course, uh, speaking about uh, light like speed events in large, very large detector, you, um, the positioning and the timing of the, uh, of the measurements of these heats it's uh, crucial. I could do a signal only about the calibrations that uh, are taking place, but basically it's reduced some less that uh, in electronics you need a control of at the nanosecond level of, of the timing that you are registering and the positioning within around 10 centimeters, which in the case of water, it's a, a bit more complicated because the medium is light, your lines are moving, and you need to do a, a real-time acoustic uh, fitting, etc. Also, you can have a... Uh, uh, an offset it well, uh, a systematic in the energy scale calibration, uh, calibration but uh, the the fluxes of neut uh, atmospheric neutrinos uh, in these detectors overlap with other independent uh, experiments. Uh, regarding this, there is, has been in the last year a revolution with machine learning techniques that are, are really, really, really improving a lot uh, this uh, event reconstruction uh, in direction and, and energy, but this is very challenging. This is a sample of the uh, two main uh, topologies that you can have in a detector. You either have an event reconstructed as a track, as track or as a shower. And also you can have the, the double bank uh, topology that uh, uh, it's uh, very infrequent, mostly because you need very high energy neutrino tau to, to have the tau fly a node before the game and separate the, the two passes that are generated in, in both uh, showers produced. So this is a, an example of how uh, one of the largest uh, neutrino events ever detected uh, in Ice Cube would look like in Granada. So this is the layout of Ice Cube, like one kilometer per one kilometer. And this is the, an event called uh, Big Bird that was uh, a 2 PV neutrino. Um, there are like a few more energetics since then, uh, but the, the record is like, uh, 10 times more, or not, not a rate to 10 times more. So this is still one of the of the largest, most energetic ones. What is the angular, angular resolution of a neutrino telescope? Well, it depends a lot, a lot uh, uh, on which um, data you select. See, if you have in your data um, an angular um, estimation of your error, and you select those with the lowest one, you will purify a lot your data and get a lot of, uh, on, remain only with events that have very low real uh, angular error. So it's it's hard to establish like a, an angular solution like in an optic uh, detector, but um, indeed it goes like a statistically. Uh, but it's uh, in, in a typical analysis, you end up with the resolutions uh, uh, below the one degree. Especially when you go to uh, upper energies in uh, to PV, PV and PVs, uh, where you stop to be dominated by the angular uncertainty from the kinematic angle of the neutrino and the moon produced in the case of the tracks, and and you can really uh, reduce a lot the, the angular error. Right? Uh, in the case of the showers, it's much more difficult difficult to detect the the, the direction, and also it can happen that if your detector is very small. Uh, when you go to higher energies, the showers are larger than the detector often, and then you cannot reconstruct very well the, the shower. So only on big, big, large detectors, you can really maintain a, 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 low, um, a low angular resolution. Uh, regarding energy resolution, it's uh, also the same. It depends a lot of the selection of data you do. In the case of tracks, uh, it's hard to define like a um, standard of which energy we speak about, because you can speak about the energy of the moon, you can speak about the energy of the neutrino that creates the moon if that moon was created by a neutrino, the deposit energy in the detector. Typically, it's, it's usually uh, mentioned the, the energy of the moon when it was getting within the, the boundaries of the detector. In the case of showers, it's much better because they usually often are container, and you can just measure the deposit energy with the detector. So. Uh, for tracks uh, regarding the analysis, it can be between a 30% and even better in some cases. And in the case of showers, uh, it can be a 5% or even better in some, in some cases. Usually when you perform astronomy or analysis of this data, it doesn't matter too much the accuracy 
or, or the precise accuracy of the energy of that event, but mm -hmm. you rely on energy estimators that allow you to distinguish uh, more energetic from less energetic events to try to, to distinguish signal from, from back. So this is a sample of uh, public data sets along years, along 10 years, from 2007 to 2017. Uh, in red, you can see the public data set of Antares. And those are the events or the neutrino candidates that have been reconstructed by Antares and used for certain analysis. Uh, for XQB, I only show the upgoing sky just to don't, to don't clutter everything in blue, but they also liberate the downgoing uh, events. And you can uh, also have a look at how unfrequent or how special are typical ice cube alerts or the high energy certain events, uh, sample of events of ice cube within the detector. This is just to give you an idea of how low is the statistics of these experiments and uh, how in the brink of statistical, how in the edge of statistical significance we are when, when we perform analysis with them. Uh, how can you perform analysis? Well, one is looking for uh, spatial correlations with uh, these this events, these neutrino candidates, uh, where you can uh, use your, the angular resolution of your detector to discriminate it from the background. Uh, you can add also the, the, um, the, the correlation with the energy, since the, the background of these uh, events is dominated by the atmospheric uh, neutrinos uh, that have a softer spectra than the cosmic signal. Or you can also constraint in time when you, you have a, a reasonable uh, signal hypothesis with a transient event uh, where you really kill a lot of, of uh, background uh, when looking for signal. Indeed, you, you require like two or three times less uh, signal for a discovery than without this uh, assumption. And so you have generally two kind of analysis. Those called binet, that is just cut and cone. You just evaluate the backgrounds uh, expected in, in an area. And then you, you see, uh, when you see your data, you see the deviation from the expected background. Or you use the unbeinant analysis that basically weight uh, continuously the properties of, of this data, data sample. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the kind of searches you can do, one are the diffuse searches. So you look just for an excess of neutrinos uh, above the backgrounds. So looking for the cosmic signal. Uh, typically, they are done in uh, just by looking in the energy dependence and uh, looking the excess that you can have at the higher energies. But you can also like uh, looking for extended regions where you can, uh, for example, in the Fermi bubbles, you can check if there is an excess just by comparing with expected backroom on other areas of equal exposure of your detector, or the same for the galactic ridge, or even you can assume some morphology from some uh, estimated emission model. For point source searches, when you look for uh, cosmic neutrino sources, you can do an all sky search or full sky, where you are looking everywhere in every direction. What you see here is are not events but a significance map. So you can see like fluctuations from from the background that uh, some of them can be uh, particularly significant. Those are the called so called hotspots, and they are particularly interesting when they are close to uh, known uh, sources. The advantage is that it's model independent, it doesn't rely on any assumption, the disadvantage is that they have a very large scale factor. You can, of course, uh, just look to a list of uh, candidates that uh, are uh, particularly promising, promising sources of uh, cosmic neutrinos. The advantage is that you reduce all the trial factor, but uh, you start to, to be model dependent. And the next most constrained model dependent is uh, the, what they are called catalog searches or stacking searches, where you just look at the at the catalog of a certain kind of sources and you assume that a parameter of those sources are proportional to the amount of signal. So maybe some sources weight more than others and you a kind of join analysis of all of them. That's very um, uh, model dependent. And of course you can do a lot of transient searches. You can just look for neutrino counterparts from gamma events, uh, or from other neutrinos in other detectors, et cetera. And we need to, to now show some res uh, interesting results from from the last years. And I'm going just to show the, the latest results or the most significant results on, on neutrino telescopes. On astronomy. So let's begin with the confirmation of the neutrino cosmic flux. So in 2015, ICE Cube already showed some excesses from the spectral backroom. More than 10 years later, 
they they are well beyond the five sigma evidence of deviation from the background in SQ uh, for this cosmic signal. So you can see here, for example, this is the energy of the neutrino flux. Uh, this is the atmospheric component. This is the cosmic component, and this is the expected uh, prompt component. So you can see that the, you have a clear excess of cosmic neutrinos coming from where? That's the next step. And that is that was a 1% size of uh, ice cube, more or less volume, uh, managed to, to, to see some interesting fluctuations. Uh, still the latest analysis are going on. But as you can see, the expected flux of, uh, of cosmic neutrinos are a bit in the edge of the capabilities of Antares to, to see some, some excess. When Chemtrinet will be completely built, uh, it's expected to detect with five sigma significance these flux within half a year of data taking. Uh, would like to, to speak a bit about um, uh, this aspect of the of the data analysis in, in, in neutrino telescopes. Here you can see different sample data samples from, from IceCube that as you can see regarding the selection and uh, how are they treated, they are sensitive to different energy ranges. So some are like more sensitive to 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 higher uh, to higher energy neutrinos of the flux and others to lower energy neutrinos of the flux, and each of them independently can uh, have a preference in the fitting of the uh, spectral index, in, assuming on a on a simple um, uh, power law, flat power law, simple power law. You can find like different spectral index for different uh, samples within IceCube. And, uh, and also like different uh, fluxes normalizations. This can explain that maybe instead to have just one uh, simple power law feature, you, you can have a more complex uh, uh, feature in, in, in the flux, like a broken power law. Uh, on this regard, even uh, probably Antares and other detectors uh, that are more sensitive to lower energies can even give uh, an answer to, to these kind of features. But we are on the brink, as you can see, of start to study this uh, these uh, particularities of the neutrino flux. Looking not all the whole of the sky, but looking for neutrinos coming from the galaxy. Very recently, IceCube uh, showed a very uh, a very interesting fluctuation from the background in the galactic ridge. Um, um, there has been analysis performed in Antares by looking in the same region, just with a contact mm -hmm. cone with a slightly uh, interesting fluctuation that goes in that direction, and also assuming uh, 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 a morphology or uh, uh, a model emission of neutrinos uh, coming from the galaxy, galaxy plane, the Kragan model. Um, this is a detail of, of the ice cube uh, significance map, where you can see uh, how this is the galactic plane. This is the, the region of the largest success that the uh, uh, is, a, is responsible of that the excess I mentioned before of neutrinos coming from the cosmic neutrinos coming from the galaxy. The color gives a hint of the spectral index that is fitted, so probably like the hardness and the softness of, of the of different sources. So it's very um, inspiring that uh, there will be like different kind of sources responsible of, of, of these uh, neutrinos. Uh, so it's possible to do a fitting on the flavor of the cosmic neutrino flux uh, ribbon to detect it. Uh, and so far, uh, ISQ have managed to, to fit something that is compatible with the assumption of mostly one, one, one equal flavor at Earth that correspond to the uh, more reasonable proportional of neutrinos at source one electron for two moons and non tap in the production. Uh, more going just to looking for sources, we we can see that um, uh, Ice Cube found that the most significant uh, one of its most significant spots and uh, it's uh, uh, with uh, NGC ten sixty eight. There it is, with uh, an interesting uh, excess of four point two sigma. Uh, the the searches uh, so when kilometer uh, net will be uh, fully built, it may be able to detect uh, with five sigma significance this kind of source uh, within three years of data taking. And in uh, Antares looking for these sources, didn't find in those uh, hotspot on on NG ten sixty eight, but on NG three distant here and three C four O three, 
with uh, some post trial that is still backward compatible, but uh, well, and these are the latest results on points of analysis in the uh, neutrino telescopes. Uh, also, there has been performed catalog searches. As I mentioned before, you just assume a kind of uh, of uh, of uh, um, astrophysical source uh, of responsible for your signal. Has been such as on blessed catalogs on uh, radio galaxies with some interesting uh, overfluctuate or overfluctuations from background. It seems that uh, could be something there. I am going to stop a bit to speak of this famous case that it was Texas 0506 that. In uh, in 2017, um, Ice Cube emit uh, so a high energy neutrino of those that we saw before emit an alert, and uh, soon it was confirmed that it was compatible with the direction with uh, Texas source that was confirmed by, by Fermi and Magic that were on a gamma ray emission state in that moment. This created a lot of uh, inspiration and emotion because it maybe would be like the coincidence that they were looking to confirm one of the first. Uh, uh, neutrino sources. The ice cube looked in the archival data of that source to check if there was something interesting, and they do a, like an untriggered flaring neutrino feeds within all the uh, neutrino that they got, and they found a very interesting uh, neutrino flare, much more significant than that isolated alert, let's say, on a different moment. That is what this has been called the anorphan flare, because we see here in, in, in black the, the gamma reactivity of Texas, in, uh, the radioactivity. Here is the alert that uh, triggered this, uh, uh, these studies. This is the period of the untriggered, uh, uh, the orphan flare of neutrinos of ice cube. And this includes also an event of GBD that was more or less in coincidence with, with the radio flare. Uh, we have been looking with other detectors, uh, especially neutrino detectors during this orphan flare, looking for coincidence. And uh, well, we found one event uh, in, uh, in Antares, it was found one event that was compatible with that play. Similar studies have been done looking for untriggered uh, flares on uh, um, um, significant, important, interesting sources, not only Texas, but also many other. And uh, the Ice Cube collaboration uh, released this. Uh, a uh, set of neutrino flares that were found on the archival data on, on these um, sources. And, and Antares has been uh, looking at the data, trying to look for some correlation of this, with uh, this being the, one of the largest uh, significance with, uh, with Texas. This triggered a lot of uh, attention, like looking for correlations uh, from uh, these high energy alerts from, from Ice Cube. Uh, some of those were compatible with uh, other uh, sources. Some were easy to be compatible with a lot of them. Uh, that may be well in, in a gamma ray emission state, etc. So there has been a lot of follow-ups, a lot of interest. Also uh, in Antares and in Kentine, we are uh, following up these, these things. Uh, and it triggers also a lot of uh, looking for potential correlations of uh, these uh, neutrino events with other messengers, uh, like uh, uh, tidal disruption events, uh, etc. Uh, there was even a, a, a use of the public data set to look in a correlation with radio emitting okay. lasers, which show some interesting uh, uh, insights and which justify a collaboration uh, that has been using instead of uh, uh, and all data set liberated uh, from that detector, but by looking with uh, uh, with all the data so far. Also, we have been following up, uh, neutrino telescope have been following up with those sets so far gravitational waves. Uh, this is like the, the last coincidence that uh, we still are missing. So far, the, there are a lot of programs that are following them up. Uh, even trying to, for many famous and particular gamma reverse, even trying to to con, uh, constrain uh, some neutrino emission models for, for those uh, events. And indeed, for we in, there is people in in, uh, in my group that is working on this and uh, even um, study the the ability of Kentrinet to 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 put constraints on these things in case of a detection once compared.
many more analysis can be done uh, via like combined analysis of ice cube and Antares, both data sets uh, combined looking for point sources or full sky. This has been done in the past, trying to uh, compensate, for example, that the ice cube, the ongoing sky is for us the uh, upgoing. Uh, so improving the sensitivity, especially on those declinations. And uh, we follow up a lot of alerts uh, like gamma ray bars, et cetera. Uh, just to finish two more things. One, uh, it's possible to detect corporal supernovas on, on neutrino telescopes, but it's a bit tricky because you are not going to uh, resolve those MEV uh, neutrino interactions in the detector when it happens, but you will expect to see a, a sudden rise in the multiplicity and, uh, of the triggering on the whole detector. Uh, and uh, so that's what is uh, been uh, uh, designed and achieved and pursued in, in Kentrinet, for example, where uh, they can detect a potentially a supernova, a core collapse supernova uh, in the neighbors of our galaxy. Um, and last, uh, I want to show something that we see that are the sun and the moon, or more particularly the shadow of the sun and the moon, uh, that they produce blocking the cosmic rays and therefore a, a, an under fluctuation of the ongoing muons reaching your detector. So this helps to the absolute positioning of the of these uh, neutrino detectors. Um, with this I end, um, neutrino telescopes are, are working up very uh, and and, and not traditional ways are uh, have they are a bit tricky to understand, uh, but they can perform astronomy as long as they they manage to reach in other statistics, and uh, they work on on the, they have a reasonable uh, resolution resolution angular resolution. Uh, it's clear that there are high energy cosmic neutrinos out there, so we are just looking for when exactly they are coming, which kind of of uh, uh, neutrino sources are out there, and probably we expect that many of those things will be clearly answered during this uh, decade. And more neutrino telescopes are coming in the way with that complete the, the sky coverage on, uh, and that also allowed to perform independent processes, which I think is really, really yeah, important. And uh, there are many hints that the, there, are, there are a rich and, uh, and uh, very diverse uh, neutrino astronomy out there. This taking into account the fact that the the <coughs> messenger astronomy helps you to to look at the uh, particular moments and reduce the vacuum makes that the probably the cooperation with other observatories doing this kind of multi messenger uh, cross checks uh, you may be able to see the signal even before than a time integrated search or uh, with an integrated search. So I believe that especially in this decade and the next one. There are settings times ahead for Nutinus for me. So thank you for, for your attention. I don't mind. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Alustin, for this nice overview about Nutrin uh, <coughs> Astronomy. And uh, now, questions, Alustin? <clears throat> So uh, very um, thank you very much for the very nice time. I was wondering about the um, uh, catalog searches or catalog connections between AGNs and uh, the neutrino events. Uh, which catalogs have you uh, used so, so far? Because <laughs> the presentation is possible connection between radio events and uh, the neutrino events, but uh, I've considered catalogs in other ways, like the Fermi catalogs, for example, the gamma rays. Or, you know, so uh, regarding the catalog searches, um, well, me personally I didn't work on them because I, well, the most similar thing is that uh, I look, for example, for uh, blasters that have very strong variabilities since I work mostly on time dependent analysis. So what I did myself was to take the Fermi catalog, for example, check the, the blasters with the uh, strongest emission, the largest uh, variability, and do a kind of a ranking, and then get one of those, and uh, study the flights of, of those low sources. Catalog searches that I use, I don't know exactly all the details. If uh, I mean, if you are looking for the correct reference of those 
and every analysis have a different one. But I know they have been uh, following uh, safer galaxies, radio galaxies uh, for a uh, blazers. I understand what well, AGN is very, but also from radio radio bla uh, blazers. Uh, because well, there was this shift in the interest since it seems that in in, gamma, in correlation with gamma phase was not clear a hint there after looking so much maybe it was on radio so uh, some people start to drift on interest on on this kind of catalogs and searches so they build up uh, radio bright uh, blazers and looking in, on those uh, flares etc etc I don't know if I'm answering your question or yeah okay fine. Thank you. you have this slide with uh, the percentages of AGNs, uh, TVs, and so on, right? Uh, percentage of AGNs, do you maybe refer uh, the, yeah, this one to is this a, thing here? Point. Yeah, so here. Yeah, this was a study. We're trying to guess the whole flux of ice cube, the excess that the uh, cosmic neutrinos that ice cube see. I mean, you refer this here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which kind of sources could be responsible or contribute up to how much? Uh, in the, and oh. for play, for blazers, indeed, it was uh, for agents was uh, uh, a constraint to to be a contribution below the thirty percent of the total flux. So the, that that's what the, the that was the comparison of of, uh, of that um, analysis. <coughs> was that study performed like? theoretically or phenomenologically uh, looking at uh, the the neutrino events coincident with uh, uh, with AGNs, TVs, or whatever? I think it was uh, an independent study um, and it was not done with uh, with the low level data of ICU or something like that. It was something, maybe there is someone that knows. No, I mean, I think it was uh, Infer from a result from ice cube from paper dedicated from ice cube and what is the limit that you can see from APN for whatever. And these people just uh, made estimation based on. Okay, thank you, Pablo. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe I can also comment on the previous question. Mm -hmm. You know, the catalogs that we were testing actually. Is where the right place and we were uh, were discussed together with radio astronomers with Yuri Kowalik and Tony the piece of Serbia. So these BLD blazers were they were helping us to construct the catalog and where to look. So basically, there were like some cut in the in the mission and then so on. in this particular study it was like two thousand options that we were looking at. Okay. I have a, a question. Can you go to slide 23? Is it was this one? Yeah, this one over here. Yeah. This one over here. So I wonder what is the difference between the angular resolution that uh, you get for muons and electron neutrinos coming from? Because the, the one from so over there for 10 net, you are supposed to be. As good as uh, uh, sub degree, yeah, as TV, yeah. sub uh, zero point one degrees, right? For new neutrinos, those are the expectations for electrons. Uh, you, you still get a bit degrees. worse. What is the reading of this? Uh, well, basically, uh, let's say that when you have a trial, you it's much more easy to to how to say to to get the direction because you have a a, a long your to detector a lot of. Uh, Points in time that give you a lot of, uh, of say, uh, and leverage. leverage. While in the shower, you only you rely on the uh, evolution of, of the shower, or it is boosted in one direction, which is uh, not so clear as in the track channel. So the main difference why it's it's harder in general to just get a good directional heat in, in showers or cascades. Is because you rely on the boosting of the evolution of the shower to detect the the direction, and that usually it's it's not as clear than when you got a track crossing your pool detector, where you have much much more. <laughs> That's the main reason why it's worse in showers. And, and the comparison between you that are that are operating in water and ice cube that is operating in uh, ice is that. Uh, 
Well, this this came from from this explanation mostly here. Yeah. In uh, in eyes, you get a lot more of scattering. So the the it depends on the amount of light you get from the event. So if you got a very energetic event, you will probably have enough light to even constrain very well. But if you don't have so much light, most of the uh, photons will have been scattered already at different times to your sensors, and it will blur some of the track passing probably. So that that's why usually uh, the the medi a medium with a uh, 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 more, more scattering is worse for angular resolution than many classes. But also for showers, right? So in ice cube. Yes, the on, on the unidirectionality, yes. But the uh, the good thing of the ice is that the absorption length is, is much lower, so you get more energy detected from the interaction. So you are better on estimating the energy in, in, in ice and showers than in, in water, in principle. Probably it will all at, at the worst it will depend on the sense of your detector, uh, how well you 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 treat your data, how much you, you improve the selection, etc. What, what are the algorithms? And currently there is a, a, a revolution on this because uh, well there, there is GraphNet on all, all this community working in graph neural networks for the reconstruction of tracks or also uh, of showers. Uh, indeed, uh, IceCube improve significantly previous analysis by in introducing uh, deep neural networks on the energy estimators of the uh, uh, showers. And uh, well, uh, it's it, during the, this decade, there is, there is still a fast evolution of, of how these uh, graph neural networks can improve your, your angular resolution by, uh, by feeding your data. And regarding the calorie, the calorie metry, can you have problems with uh, very high energy events, for example, the one you have in your previous slide, mm. uh, or the, the, the one in which you have got another <laughs> one of the, these very big, yeah, so mm -hmm. this one in uh, in game 3 net it would be? No, it, it will fit perfectly, because game 3 maybe is half height, but it will be two blocks of the same base, one kilometer, one kilometer, so if it happens not there, but there, it was on a, uh, uh, equal uh, size, so it's let's say that in a fast way, approach uh, ice cube is like if you cut this half and then you push, push it uh, besides, let's say, you know, a bit. Uh, so no, you you will see it because the internet yeah. will be that that large, that big. Currently, it's under construction, so it's a bit like Antares, where you you are small and an event like this, you will not uh, have it completely contained within the detector, but the that's because of the size. Uh, Kentnet will be able to fully contain this kind of effect of events. Okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. More questions? Short one. Uh, my question is if there is an alternative to glaciers to explain the Sarawak neutrino flux, mainly just well, because, I mean, the, the the studies that you have shown are not highly significant, and even in the case of PXS or 506, uh, there, are there has been a shift between going from laser to looking something like another galaxies or safer yeah. galaxies, or because it's rational that uh, maybe you are you are going to see neutrinos mostly on on accelerators where the the, the accelerators completely obfuscated by the medium. Where you got a lot of dense target media, you can get a lot of neutrinos coming from. So instead to see a clear gamma reactivity, you, you get all that container, you don't see that, but you see the neutrinos. So that's the case for NGC, that uh, it's it's uh, it's it's not uh, a very uh, it's not a gamma reactivity laser. It's uh, I think it's a safer galaxy or something. Like safer galaxy, and uh, yeah, seen. Uh, NG ten sixty eight, yes. Yeah. So yeah, especially uh, when this uh, came out, uh, people start to look even more to to potential models of neutrino production of, uh, on this kind of uh, of galaxies. So for, like, okay, we don't have a gamma ray clue about it, but maybe. How can the neutrinos be produced because of this? Maybe the, the gamma ray get absorbed and uh, you only see the neutrinos coming out and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. 
Argamory bursts also uh, handling? Uh, there are models with some expected neutrino facts and some conditions, but so far mm, has been no evidence or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. um, indeed, during the last decade, I remember that the models have been constrained even more and more and more by the lack of, of uh, evidence or access mm -hmm. on that. Okay. 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 Otherwise, we will thank him again. I don't know if in the chat I didn't uh, look. Mm -hmm. No, no question. Ah, okay. Sorry, I forgot to repeat the questions. But I expect that the answers and make understand the, the question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's all right. Okay. Thank you. Perfecto. No,